Welcome to Hope Church. Um, we'll probably have some more rolling in, in the, over the next few minutes, hopefully, maybe. Um, but if not, man, thank you so much for being here. We've like, our last teaching night was on women in ministry and we've like quadrupled our attendance. And so that's like a huge win um, tonight. And so I love it. A, a lot of people may get kind of encouraged or discouraged with like kind of small attendance, but I, I love this. I love the intimacy. I think God does such beautiful things in, in small groups like this. And so I'm really excited. It's a conversation that we're engaged in and we're gonna continue talking about as long as we exist. And so there's plenty of time for everybody to continue learning. Um, my name is Joel. We have a couple visitors with us um, from outside of Hope. Welcome. Um, I'm Joel. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, I will t share my story a little bit later on, but just kind of a, a brief synopsis. I've been in recovery for almost five and a half years now. Um, and thanks, man. And uh, I started coming here when I was like two or three months clean. And um, man, so this place just holds such a special place in my heart. It's been a very safe place for me um, to be on this journey of recovery. And so I'm incredibly passionate about recovery, um, reaching the uh, addiction community, not just drug and alcohol addiction, but porn addiction, um, control addiction, just anything, any addiction that people are dealing with. Um, and so at Hope, about half of our congregation is in recovery. Um, or fighting for recovery. And so um, it's a very important conversation for us to be not just involved in, but kind of leading the charge. Um, I, I want to kind of kick off with just a quick question. Um, how many of you, and don't be shy, how many of you know someone who has struggled or is struggling with addiction, or you yourself has struggled or are struggling with addiction? Can you just see a show of hands? Okay, so just a kind of a quick, look. keep your hand up, and everybody just like look around. So the reason for the evening is this, right? That's it. That's, that's the reason for the evening. It's a topic that all too often goes unaddressed, and it's so unbelievably misunderstood, and so consequently we're incredibly uncomfortable interacting with it, having conversations about addiction. But it's such an obvious place for us to step into as the church. And why do I say that? I say it because... Every single one of us, the show of hands just showed it. And if this room was full, I, 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 quick side note, about, I don't know when it was, when did we speak at GMHC? Yeah, so yeah, a long time ago. But there were about 3,000 people, and I asked that same question, and every single person raised their hand. It was unbelievably moving, heartbreaking. So I say that to say, all of us, whether we know it or not, are connected with people who are struggling with addiction, and many of us actually ourselves are struggling with it and may not even realize it in so many different ways. And, and if you're somebody who thinks, I don't really know anybody, just wait. You will. You do. You just haven't found out yet. And one of the most difficult things about the addiction conversation is that it's incredibly nuanced because it's a, it's a topic that, that handles both disease and sin. Both of these things are wrapped up in it, and so it's tough to navigate. It's tricky for us. And so oftentimes, because it's tricky, we just kind of step out of it. But these two realities, disease and sin, have to be addressed in tandem for us to successfully see any successful recovery. So tonight, we're going to be addressing four major things. We're going to be looking at what the disease of addiction is, and my wife Tracy um, is going to be teaching us that. It's going to be super nerdy and super fun. I love it. Hopefully, we got some like nerds in here that love all that kind of stuff. Um, then we're going to be looking at stigma in the church. Well, actually, right after Tracy, we're going to hear from Kim Ryan. She's going to be sharing her story um, with us. Then we'll be looking at stigma in the church, a biblical view of addiction, and how do we meaningfully engage with the addiction community as the church. So I would love to just open us up in prayer real quick, and then Tracy will come on up. Spirit, we thank you for 
waiting for us in this place. For being here, for saturating these pews, these walls, the airspace, our hearts and minds. God, we just want tonight to be a beautiful offering to you. A time where we can open our minds, address stigmas, address biases, get honest with ourselves, and realize that we're actually all not that different. Lord, I pray that you would just move tonight in a way that only you can move. If not, but just one person in here that they would walk out this evening with their heart, their mind transformed, maybe identifying something in their own life that needs addressing, or that's a win. God, we thank you for the individuals that are here. We just ask you to bless our time together, be with myself, Tracy, Kim, the people on the panel afterward. We just pray that it would be a sweet aroma to you. God, we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tracy Frame. Thank you, everyone. Now for the nerdy part. <laughs> no, I get to talk a little bit about addiction, what it is, and medications and so forth. So, Adam. Oh, okay. So the definition of addiction, is it? It's not up there, so I have to look up here. Okay. So addiction is a treatable chronic, chronic, a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. So people use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. So when we think about addiction, there's something called the four C's. Does anybody know the four C's? I'm a super interactive person because I'm a teacher, so I'm sorry. I'll ask you questions. So cravings, compulsive use, using despite the consequences, and loss of control. So loss of control in the amount they use or loss of control in how often people are using, right? So it's four C's. So there's something called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway in your brain. I know that's a really big word, but basically it's just the reward system in your brain. So the reward system in your brain basically says like, I need you to, it's, it's kind of goes back to like the natural survival mode. So you need to eat and you need to drink, right, to survive. So your body, God made our bodies, right, with, the, with this neurotransmitter called dopamine. So when you eat something or you drink something as a baby, your body says like, oh, this is good, right? Like I should be doing this because it's making me survive. So there are things like that that we do because our body is just formed into a habit of like, I enjoy this because it's helping me survive. So what happens is that system kind of gets overridden by um, any type of drug, alcohol, um, anything like that. So what happens is when you take something like that, specifically something like heroin, cocaine, something like that, it basically causes a huge dopamine surge. So way more than like your natural surge of dopamine that your body naturally produces. So when it produces that huge dopamine surge, and they say at least 10 times that amount, all of a sudden it rewires your brain because your brain says, wait a second, that's way better, right, than that food or the drink or whatever I was doing. I need this. So ultimately what happens is people are like, I want that again. So they use again, right? And then over time, as people continue to use over and over and over again, your uh, receptors in your brain decrease in like sensitivity to that dopamine. So eventually, they people have to keep using more and more and more because they wanna keep getting that same high. So what that leads to is they lose, they also um, kind of lose desire to do the things that they need to do for survival. So that's why you see when people come in, they haven't been taking care of themselves, they haven't been eating very well, um, their teeth might be, like they don't, they don't have a, any drive to do that because their brain just says, I need this drug now, right? And so that's how we know that like, it's really not a choice, it's really a disease because their brain is saying, I need this, forget all these other things like eating and 
drinking and taking care of my children, all of these other things that I know I should be doing, my brain saying, definitely, definitely do this. Does that make sense? So there's also a part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex. It kind of takes over and hijacks that as well. And that's the type of, that's the part of your brain that really is like the decision making and those kind of things that you um, do impulse, right? So people that are in active addiction, they're super impulsive, right? Like, okay, well, forget it. Uh, yeah, that's food over there, but I'm gonna go over here because the drug's over here. Um, so that's very, it's very impulsive. And so your brain really takes over that, uh, the drug takes over that prefrontal cortex. And really that's when people start to lose their job. They lose their relationships, right? They lose their kids. So that's why when people wind up where I work, like they've lost everything because that part of their brain has said like, I don't need this part of my brain because what I do need is this, right? Because that drug has said, I'm way more important. Does that make sense? Okay, wonderful. So this is just really quick statistics. And I don't, Troy actually might know more recent st statistics than me. Um, but this was the most recent thing they've published is from 2021, which is obviously as of two years ago. But I do want you to see that like in 2019, the number of overdose deaths was 70,630 in the country. And then 2021, it went up to 106,700. Obviously we know COVID kind of happened around that time, but also fentanyl really kind of came on the market, like started really coming on board. So I would say over the past couple of years, as I've worked in the, um, the addiction center I work in, fentanyl is pretty much what everybody's using at this point, and it's kind of laced in everything that they're using. Keep going, Adam. Um, this, I just wanted to show you again why that is. So you can see the gray line uh, as we work into 2021. That's basically fentanyl. So you can see fentanyl has really increased our drug overdose rate there. So that's kind of just showing that and what I just basically said. And then this is Tennessee, and so you can see we're in that middle pocket right there where there's a high overdose rate as well as East Tennessee. So if you've heard about East Tennessee, they're doing a lot of really great things over there because of the overdose rate. And I think, you know, Davidson County and the surrounding counties are obviously recognizing it and everyone's trying to get involved, but I did want you to see that. And then this is just Tennessee. So do you know, what is the, what was the most recent, do you know? It's okay. Okay, so this was a little, or around 4,000 in 2021 for just Tennessee. All right, so addiction in the brain. You can keep going, Adam. So one thing I really wanted to talk about is adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. Have any, has anybody heard about ACEs? Yeah? So adverse childhood experiences are things that are like traumatic or stressful events for people. So they kind of look at things like abuse, so physical, emotional, sexual abuse. And then we also look at neglect, so physical or emotional neglect. And then we kind of just look at household things. So we look at like intimate partner violence, a parent that was treated violently, so like a mom that's treated violently by a spouse or a man in the house or whatever it may be, um, a substance misuse within the household, if there's household mental illness, uh, parental separation or divorce, and then incarcerated, incarcerated household members. So those are basically the questions on this ACE um, scoring thing you take, right, that we give patients. And we've found that if the ACE score is at least five or more out of 10, that people are seven to 10 times more likely to use drugs and become addicted, which is crazy. I mean, so you look at like, I think it was, I looked up statistics. So 64% of US adults have experienced at least one ACE score or one ACE score before the age of 18. And 17.3% had four or more. So we know that when people hit four or more, their risk goes up so much for not only addiction, but also for chronic disease states like heart attack, diabetes, obesity, all, cancer, all of these things go up and their life expectancy actually goes down. So we're finding more and more about adverse childhood experiences. The big thing I just wanted to talk about that is just how I think we need to recognize, especially um, with kiddos. So if kids use, and we talked about that brain and like your brain forming, and if you guys don't know, um, people's brains don't fully like form form until they're mid 20s, right? So you have a 12 year old who starts using at a really young age or has ACE experiences and starts using, like that's totally gonna mess up their 
survival in their brain, right? And so all of a sudden, it's much harder, like alcohol or drugs goes to the top, food, water, all of that goes underneath it. And so the, it, they're finding out that that's actually harder to flip around, even if they stop using, if they do it before the age of 21. So when we talk about kids drinking before 21, like it's a huge push because your brain's not even formed and you're telling your brain, oh, this is what I want. And it's so hard after that to re, um, retrain your brain. So this is just uh, what we consider dopamine receptors. And so this is the brain. So we have the brain normal on the left side and the brain on whatever substance in the right side. And what I just wanna point out here is this, it basically looks at like energy or glucose in the brain, right? And so what you see here on the left side is full activity. So you see a lot more activity with the red. So red means more activity. And then in any, anybody using substances, you see that there's a lot less red. So the brain literally starts to decrease sensitivity like I talked about to dopamine. So people really start to have like a blunted response to emotions and all that kind of stuff and their brain's literally just saying like, I just need this drug, right? Your body's not naturally producing it anymore and you're just saying, I just need it. This is another one. And I would say it takes, they say it takes a minimum of two years for people's brains to start to look normal again when they stop using altogether. So it's not gonna happen in like three months. Like it takes time for your body to build back up natural dopamine, right? And like, and for a lot of people, especially when we talk about kiddos that maybe started at a young age and they don't have those um, like good core memories. So people that start using at an older age actually do better in recovery a lot because they can go back to like, oh, I remember like, you know, when I had a great time in high school with my friends or my, you know, if they have good parent relationships or something like on a vacation and all these things, but people that start using or were sexually abused at the age of two, three, like they don't have those good core memories to come back to. So they, they literally are just stuck in, a, in an addicted brain and then they have to have people help them, come around them and say like, okay, here's positive coping skills or here's things that you can do or let's find what you like to do. I always tell my patients that. I'm like, everybody likes to do different things. Some people like to color. Some people like to write music. Some people like to do whatever. So you have to find what makes you happy. Cool. Okay, this is kind of the nerdy section. Uh, but just quickly, I wanted to talk about opioids just so that everybody can understand what opioids do. So there are multiple opioid receptors in your body. The one that we typically talk about when we talk about opioid addiction is the mu receptor. Um, they're found everywhere. So you see, because they're found everywhere in your body, you have all these crazy effects, right? So if you go to the next slide. Um, we have what we call full agonist. So the, I, I'm trying to break this down really easy, but full agonist is like a full activator. So it's most of the opioids you see, fentanyl, heroin, oxycodone, any of those, right? They're full agonists. So what they do is they bind to those receptors in all those parts of the body, right? And they fully activate them. And when they fully activate them, they cause these kind of effects, right? So pain relief is the one we think of, right? People get opioids because they had surgery. So pain relief. But when we also talk about that, we can think of euphoria. So when we think of heroin or fentanyl, it can cause euphoria. It also can decrease anxiety initially, okay? So that can be helpful for people. But the bad things and the other areas that it binds to are, uh, are, can cause side effects that people aren't the biggest fan of. So pinpoint pupils, people can get constipation, they can get nauseous, uh, mental clouding, impaired judgment, slurred speech, drop in blood pressure. And ultimately, why we see overdose is because it binds, the opioids bind to something in your brain stem and it causes you to stop breathing. And that's why people overdose is because there's too many opioids that have um, bound to those receptors in the brain stem and it basically stops you from breathing. So that's why you see overdose. So again, that's typically most of our opioids. Then we have something called the partial agonist. So it's a partial activator, okay? So it still is an opioid and it still binds and causes opioid-like effects, but it only does it to a certain extent. So you're not gonna have the full effect, you're gonna have a partial effect. So you can still get some euphoria from it. I'm not gonna like discount that, okay? So people can get that. Um, and you, you can just tell have pain relief, so it can be helpful in people that might have pain relief. Um, but you really won't get that full, full effect. You'll get more sedated and all that kind of stuff before you would get that full effect. And then lastly, we have what's called an antagonist or a deactivator. And this is something that binds those receptors and it blocks them. So it doesn't activate them at all, but it blocks those receptors. So it really doesn't have any like effects, like really not any pain relief or anything like that like you would expect to see with an opioid. 
So really quickly, before I'm done, so when we talk about those receptors, medications we use to help with um, treatment of addiction, and I want to throw it out there, like, yes, I'm a pharmacist. Yes, I think medis medicines are great. Actually, I try to get people off medicines as a pharmacist. But um, medications are awesome in the addiction world, especially when people are really trying to get, off, get in recovery at first, and they've been on fentanyl for a long time. If people have been on substances for a long time, especially fentanyl, it sits in people's fat stores, and it takes forever for it to come out. So people will come in and they'll be like, I'm feeling great, it's been three days, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh gosh. Um, and then they crash probably around like five, six, seven days in, right? Because it's slowly seeping out of their fat and it's terrible and they feel terrible, it's awful. So we can use things like medication assisted treatment to kind of help them through that and then have a discussion of like, again, their brain's not even ready to think about recovery. People are basically getting through physical stuff probably for the first three months before we can even think about like, okay, how can we help start to heal the brain? So there are medications that can help during that time period. But in addition to that, like counseling, therapy, all of those things are so important, getting a sponsor. So there are different medications. So there's something called methadone. Methadone is a full agonist, so it binds and fully activates that receptor. It lasts for a long time. People have to go to a clinic every single day and get it. So it makes it really hard for people to be on that, especially when we start thinking about like rural areas, right? Like people have to drive an hour, hour and a half every single day to get this medication. And they can't take more of it because they will overdose. People do become tolerant just like they do to heroin and they need more and more and more doses. Um, we just saw somebody a couple days ago at my clinic that was on a very, very high dose of this um, because her body had become more and more tolerant to it. So. It can be helpful though, especially in our patients that have uh, overdosed multiple times or have serious pain management issues. Like I do see a place in therapy, but very rarely do I feel like I see a place in therapy with methadone. Then we have buprenorphine. It's a partial agonist. So again, it kind of binds and it only acts so much, right? So buprenorphine is really good in the fact that because it has that partial agonist effect, people really don't get high off of it, okay? maybe a smidgen, but they're not gonna, not like heroin, so they can still have quality of life. They can still be involved with their kids. Um, they can kind of get back into a routine, right? And we can come around them at that point. This is where that, that whole piece of like, the whole person care comes into play. So we kind of get around them and help them um, learn with coping skills and so forth. So examples of buprenorphine are things you probably heard are like Suboxone or Bunivel, that, that's buprenorphine. Okay, so it's, it can be a very helpful drug, especially in the beginning with patients, especially when patients are coming off things like fentanyl. We, we use it when people are withdrawing as well because it kind of helps with those symptoms. And then we have naltrexone. Naltrexone is the antagonist, so it blocks and prevents. So it helps with cravings. Um, and it is not a controlled substance, so like the other two. So it's, it, you know, when people come off of it, they don't feel crummy because they're not coming off of opioids. They're just coming off of an antagonist. You can get it as an injection, use once a month. And then the only other thing I wanted to say was naloxone. So naloxone is like naltrexone, it's a blocker, but it's what we use in overdose. So it's what you all know as Narcan, probably, you know that? Okay, cool. That's naloxone. So that's really just used in overdose, not in treatment. Did I cover it all okay? You got, does anybody have any questions really quick? No? Okay. Oh, I forgot about this part. So, one other thing I wanted to say. So, myths in regard to medication-assisted treatment. I honestly, personally despise these myths. Like, it drives me crazy that people say this stuff. So, they are just substituting one drug for another. I think we need to be really careful with that, especially when we talk about buprenorphine. Again, people, especially people that have been using chronically and for a long time, when they first get into recovery and expecting them, you know, if, especially if they're not willing or ready yet, I think expect, expecting people to go cold turkey or, or shaming them, especially in the addiction community, we see that. Um, it, can be, it can be really hard for people and then their risk of relapse is so much greater. Um, MAT is a mor moral failure or matter of not having enough willpower, the person's to pray more. Um, again, I think realizing that this is a disease and really not a choice, like it's your brain literally saying like, this is what I need. So this is what you should do. And I think I, I explained to my students, like, as a mom, I would do anything to take care of my kids, right? Like, whatever I can do to, like, care for them and take care of them best I can. And these moms that I see every single day are not choosing their kids over drugs and alcohol or whatever it is. So for me, like, that tells me that it is 
has to be a disease, right? It is not a choice because as a mom myself, the last thing I would do is not want to take care of my kids, right? And they care about their kids so much, but it's like their brain saying, no, do this instead. Um, MAT is only for the weak who can't do it without meds. Again, I think that's kind of an old school thought process. I think that medications can be really, really helpful. Um, at least I've seen it. And I, I would say now with fentanyl out there, like, it's hard, y'all. Like, I, watching people daily go through this is terrible. So I think just realizing that, like, some people and a lot of people are going to need meds, especially at first. Uh, it's only for the short term, I think it said. Sorry, Adam. Um, again, meds. Sometimes people need them for six months. Sometimes people might need them for a couple years, but I think we have to think about the whole person. If they're still living in a really crappy environment around the same people doing stuff like that, then it may not be time for them to come off meds. But if they're in a much better place, they got their kids back, they have good support system, all that stuff, then a discussion can be had. But that's a conversation that needs to be done with the provider. Increase the risk for overdose. Not really true. People, when they're educated on it, like we talk about that risk. Um, but really, when we talk about like buprenorphine, like Suboxone, people are always really worried that people are going to overdose on it. People will overdose if they take it with alcohol and benzos, but not really just itself, because it has that partial effect. Uh, my patient's condition is not severe enough for MAT. I've kind of already talked about that. MAT is a crutch on the road to recovery. Abstinence is the only way that works. Again, some of this stuff is really, I would say, a little bit more older. Um, and kind of thought process, especially when we talk about fentanyl now. So truth, we do know that medications really do help reduce or block cravings. They can reduce the chance of relapse. They decrease or stop actual illicit opioid use. I mean, that's the thing. What, like, for me, it's like if my patient's not ready and I can get them on something like buprenorphine or Suboxone versus them going out and using, at least I know, at least I know what they're taking, right? And it's not something off the street that's laced and they can overdose on. So I think we have to remember that. Um, increases retention and treatment, improves quality of life, improves health and functioning, and reduces overdose rate. They actually show that people that were using buprenorphine from other people that were selling it on the street actually decreased overdose rate, even though they were using it without a prescription. A lot of times, at least for my patients, People use buprenorphine to help with withdrawal, right? And so I think that that can also be helpful when we talk about that on the streets. Any other questions? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Kim. This is really nerve-wracking right now. Kim in recovery. Um, so. I have five to seven minutes. Right. <laughs> um, so when Tracy was talking about genetics, trauma, opportunity. So with me, um, genetics for me, I have um, both parents in the military. I was born in Germany, went to 16 different schools, um, the oldest of two other sisters. Um, and both parents drank a lot. Smoking weed in my family was like the best thing ever. Um, when you become 13, you can hang out with the adults, smoke weed. You know, we couldn't wait to get to that age. Um, that's genetics and opportunity. Um, trauma for me was started at the age of nine. I was raped and molested by my uncle um, and then put on antidepressants at a really young age. So for me, I feel like, and I didn't really get an opportunity to like go therapy or anything like that in my family. You brush things under the rug, move on. Um, so that was in California, and we moved back to Tennessee. Um, when we moved back to Tennessee, I bounced around from school to school. Um, I was always the new girl, so I wanted to fit in, and I did pretty well with that. I'm pretty outgoing. Um, I always, you know, was probably, well, pretty popular because I was the new girl, so it was like, you know, this new shiny toy. Um, and I hung out with really bad crowds, um, and there was always drugs involved. So that was like my way of dealing with what had happened to me at a young age. Um, I went through high school. I was like a weekend warrior, snuck out a lot, ran away a lot. Um, also, daddy's little girl, so I got away with murder. Um, and I met my ex-husband 
at 18, it was my senior year in high school, um, we got married and I thought I had this perfect little life. Um, we used, for us, like using drugs on the weekends, on holidays, now I know like that's just an excuse, like that was my justification, oh it's New Year's, time to do coke, like it was just, you know, normal. Um, and then something really bad happened, um, you know, in between the really bad, we got into pain clinics. Um, my husband at the time was a manager at Cook's Pest Control. We had really good insurance, and we paid $5 a month for two pages of prescriptions for opiates. And we didn't think anything was wrong with that. You know, we could get our medicine, and at first we took it the way it was supposed to be taken. And then next thing I know, I didn't have any more, and he was out, and it just spiraled out of control. Um, after we bought our second house, we lived there about a year, and I found out that my husband was sleeping with my best friend who lived across the street, who was my boss at work. Um, it was pretty devastating. Um, like I said, I had this like perfect, like on the outside marriage. It was like Rhett and Kim, Kim and Rhett, and you know, we were like just the life of the party all the time, and that blew up in my face. I had a three-year-old son. Um, I didn't really know what to do other than go home, pack my stuff, and get my son and leave. And I did that, but I was raised in a Catholic family, so you don't do divorces. <laughs> um, so I told him, if you want to work on your family, you know, come to this hotel. I'd got a weekly rate hotel. And that night, um, he took me to Walmart, was like going to buy me all these nice things at Walmart because we live in Tennessee, and that's a great thing. Um, I was super excited, <laughs> walking around Walmart, sucking on a fentanyl patch. I literally don't remember much after that. I remember rolling a joint in the hotel room, my three-year-old over there playing on his little play, Playboy or Playboy PlayStation, and I remember telling him to make sure he takes the trash out. Um, what I didn't tell you was that we were also big, big-time drug dealers for weed. Um, we had all that in the room. I had a gun, um, none of which were registered. Uh, that night I fell asleep. I had smoked both ends of the joint. I was so messed up, y'all. Like I had taken all my Xanaxes. Um, we had acid, shrooms, ecstasy, like you name it. We had it and it was all on the counters. When I woke up that morning, I woke up butt naked to a cop at the foot of my bed telling me that they had found my husband in the mulch bed overdosed seven heartbeats a minute. He was in a coma on his way to the ER. I caught a lot of charges that night. I had never been in any trouble ever, uh, not even a speeding ticket yet. And they called DCS. They were like, you need to take a drug test. I was like, no, I don't. I can tell you what, <laughs> I'm gonna melt it. It's not, you know, it's not gonna be good. So I didn't take the drug test. They took my child from me um, for two weeks after that. My, well, my dad bonded me out, you know, dads give you that one time, he bonded me out and went to the hospital, got him into treatment, but nobody even thought about like, what about me? Like, what about me? So I went to a hotel detox for two weeks, I went up to DCS every single day. I remember waiting outside that building and like just waiting. It wasn't like, they didn't even tell me to go up there, but I wanted my baby back. Like that was, really bad um, these aren't even half the sad tears these are happy tears <laughs> um, so I got my kid back but I had to have supervised so I moved in with my dad I left my house we had a really nice house um, two-car garage a pool in the back fenced in yard because it looked good on the outside. Um, but on the inside, it was obviously, he wasn't happy at home. Um, so I left that house, just literally, I left everything in it. I didn't even pack anything. I left it, I didn't want anything from all that. I was so devastated. And I moved in with my dad, and when he came home from treatment, during treatment, I was going back and forth to Alabama to do um, family counseling. And while that's going on, I'm passing her, because she was going and visiting him too. 
I tried for six years. And after about six years, I was like, you know what? Screw him. Screw this. His family had even bought a house and was renting it to us. Like, nothing was changing. I was shooting everything under the sun. It didn't matter. I was a garbage can for any drug you had. Um, and I had, I remember him telling me, if you ever feel like, you need to get me back for my affair, just leave me because I don't want you to have to look in the mirror and see what I have to look at every day. I wish I'd listened because I didn't do that. I found his closest friend and got him back. Um, I ended up getting with a guy that was mentally, physically, and verbally abusive. I'm not gonna blame him for everything because um, we were just really bad off on drugs really, really bad off on drugs. Um, I stayed with him for about nine years, and during that nine years, I slept with whomever I had to to make sure I had drugs for him and I. I stole from whoever I had to. I was banned from every, I am banned from Walmart. I'm not even supposed to be there. Um, it, like any means necessary, literally. Um, I, my aunt who's gone now, like she died from complications due to her drug use. She's my godmother, and I was helping her shoot up. Like, and this is my dad's little sister. Like, if you guys knew my family, like, really? <laughs> I can't believe I even did that. Um, just like stuff that I have to live with now. Um, and so after I left, after I left my husband and I got with or Terry for nine years, went through all that crap, and I caught so many charges, drug charges. My house got raided three times. I've served, of the past 10 years, I've served close to five years in Rutherford County Jail or Coffee County. Those are my two. Um, so many charges, like I've got 32 mug shots and I get to go in, today I get to go speak at Murfreesboro Police Department to, it's a police academy, Citizens Police Academy, and it's just for people that come and I'm trying to break the stigma that people look at us like we're a piece of crap um, or how the police treat us because I've had some really bad dealings with them. Um, three things that got me to go to treatment was, one, me and Terry, my ex, were on our way to re-up and on the way there, we got off at Haywood Lane. If y'all are familiar with Haywood Lane, there's a rock on the right and this will probably be in your mind now, you're welcome. Um, we were going to re-up and there was a little Hispanic man sitting on that rock and he had no shoes on, he was drunk, had a bad night, had a bad fight with his dad, felt pretty hopeless, stepped out in front of our car and killed himself. And we sat on the side of um, I-24 for five hours waiting because another pedestrian had got hit at Briley Parkway, but they lived and he did not, so that took precedent. So we had to sit there. Um, that was pretty traumatic. I still have issues with that. Um, another thing that got me to go was um, one of my very, very, very close friends had been in jail seven months and gave me a call, knew that I was like very, it was very easy for me to get drugs. So he called me up, Kim, I wanna get high. I knew he was in sober living. I knew it was probably not a good idea, but it was time for me to re-up. So I was like, sure, come on, let's go. Um, went to Nashville, got my drug of choice at that time was meth and hair or fentanyl, not heroin. And we went back to our hotel room. I had an eight ball and my tolerance was very, very high. John can attest to that. <laughs> and I shot up that whole eight ball that night and was still wide awake. He got like a sugar packet amount, a sugar packet, smoked it. Um, he stayed home from work that night and left at six that morning. And by five that evening, I was surrounded by narcotics detectives because he was on life support. They found him overdosed. And he overdosed on smoked foils because he didn't have anything that I thought. And they did find a baggie in his hand, which was later um, a duplicate of a baggie found in my hotel room whenever I told them, yeah, I helped facilitate that buy, and they came and searched my room. They had me on a second degree murder charge for that. Um, another 
thing that pushed me into treatment was being involved in a shooting in Hermitage at the Roadway Inn, which is now condemned. Um, but like those three, uh, that all happened like within six months of each other, like not of each other, within a six month span. And it was like, what do I do? And whenever they were threatening me with, you know, having to go to prison, like I could do jail on my head. That is nothing, nothing to me. But to think that I would never be able to see my kid again, that's really what pushed me. My kid does not keep me sober. He never has and never will. And I know that now. I remember going into treatment being like, I'm going to do this for Russell. And I quickly learned that that's not a thing. I had to go in for me. I did not love myself. I didn't like the person I saw in the mirror. I looked like Chucky's mom before crack because I fell asleep on fentanyl with bleach in my hair and I had hair down to my butt and had to cut it all off. <laughs> um, just like, I, I just, I hated the person I saw. I, I wore black clothes, Doc Martens, and really dark eye makeup and it was just horrible. And I remember being in treatment and I didn't want any, any drugs or anything because I've been putting so many and I don't recommend this for other people, but for me, I needed to remember the pain and the absolute torment and hell that I went through for 16 days straight of detoxing. And I'm talking, the only peace I found was when I opened my Bible, the only peace I found. And you know, whenever I, today I get to help people get into recovery and I am a big, I, I'm a big supporter of the rooms, big supporter, but I can say for me, it was my higher power. For me, that's what really got me. Um, I mean, I've even, I'm a little over two years sober now, and I've gotten to a point where, and I haven't made it through the 12 steps. I have not, because I'm really bad on procrastination. But I've done a lot, <laughs> I've done a lot of like soul searching and praying and I think that I'm at a point now, and there's going to be some people that are going to say, mm, probably not, but I'm at a point now where I want, I want a spiritual advisor because that's what helped me. That was the only thing that started helping me to turn all of that darkness into a light. And I don't even have enough time to sit up here and tell y'all all the crap that, like, within my story, but that's pretty much the gist of it. And today, here I am, 9 20 21 is my sober date. So, some of y'all, as you were hearing Kim share, just such an unbelievable story. Um, you might be thinking, man, she's like just spilling all the tea. This is like nothing held back. And that, that might be kind of strange for some, some who hear that. But one of the most beautiful things is that in recovery, we learn to do that. Um, unashamed, unembarrassed, and understanding that on the other side of that lies freedom. And so it's so beautiful. Um, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but if you, you are surrounded by meetings all over this city that are open meetings that you can go to and just sit and listen and hear stories like that three times a day if you wanted to. It's unreal. Um, so, Kim, thanks, sister. I love you. Um, so I first want to talk about, um, real quick, uh, just stigma in the church, because it's, it just kind of goes without saying, we know that there's a stigma when it comes to addiction in the church. So often people look at, at, at addiction as this sin that's greater than all the others. And I think a lot of times it's because overt addictions like drugs and alcohol can kill you. And so we, we just kind of put it on this pedestal. And when we talk about something like porn addiction, we put it on an even, uh, kind of an even higher list of sins, of these untouchable sins. And on paper, we may act like, we may say, 
that everybody's welcome, that we, we treat everybody the same. But the experiences of people wrestling with the disease of addiction tell a very different story. We're often treated differently, spoken to as, or spoken of as kind of separate than the body, kind of like a subsection of the church body. We get othered very regularly, and we can see people that as they smile at us, they're also keeping an eye on us. And uh, it, it's, it's hurtful, and it, and it happens all the time. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's what keeps a lot of people closed off um, from sharing their story. Because honestly, <clears throat> and when I say we, I mean the universal church, okay? Um, if we hear that somebody is struggling with anger or, or something along those lines, we can stomach that because we can relate to it, we can understand it. But if somebody's struggling with heroin, fentanyl, looking at pornography, we immediately categorize this person as more broken, whether conscious or subconscious, we do it. We categorize this person as more broken, and we kind of, if we're really honest with ourselves, we, we kind of curse them to always be an addict, always be identified as this thing. You see, people often think that they don't have anything to offer people in the addiction and recovery community if they've never used hard drugs or if they've never sold their bodies or or fill in the blank. They feel like if they haven't lived it, they can't really speak into it. And so instead, we, we, we see people kind of puff up and we hear things like, just stop using. Just stop doing the thing that you're doing. I can't believe you don't love your family or your kids enough to stop this thing. Aren't you sick and tired of just being sick and tired? And the answer to that last one is, yeah, absolutely we are, but we don't know where to go from this point. And these cold questions, they're often not ill-intentioned. I I really believe that. I believe that they come from a place of just simply not understanding. And as, as I, I love like when Tracy gets super nerdy like that because it's it's so it, it's so confusing and beautiful, and we we see there's so many layers to this. It's not just what it looks like on the surface. And so there's just it's hard to understand if we don't take the time to understand it. But I think more times than not. Stigma, people coming very harshly toward people who are experiencing addiction. I think it often comes from a place of self-preservation. The vast majority of people in this world are not willing to take a serious introspective look at their own lives to see how they themselves are struggling. Or they know exactly how they're struggling what they're struggling with, they just don't want to come to terms with it, or they don't want other people to find out. And I get it, it is absolutely terrifying. It's the most terrifying, freeing thing I've ever done in my life. But it is so terrifying to realize that your life is going to be ripped wide open for everybody to be able to look into. When I entered into recovery a little over five years ago, it was the most terrifying, messiest, gut-wrenching thing I have ever experienced. But it led to a life so abundant and beautiful that I would walk through it a thousand times over again. There are multiple goals for this evening. Some of those have been met. We discussed them at the start of the night, but chief among them, right now is I want to try to help all of us to get to understand that we all wrestle with addiction or using something to cover up woundedness in some way or another. We are all in need of recovery. I believe it is essential for us to make this connection as the starting point when we begin discussing how to address stigma in the church, how to eliminate stigma, and how to engage with the addiction and recovery community. You see, over the years, 
I've had so many beautiful opportunities to speak to rooms and groups and, and things, and, and it's so fun to go into rooms where people, um, they know that they have this, this addiction, um, they know that they're in recovery from this thing, they, they've come out about it, they've admitted it, and I, and I get to speak to them, and it, it's such a beautiful thing. And in those rooms, oftentimes, people who don't have some overt addiction or aren't in recovery are referred to as normies, okay? So just normal people, right? And I used to say that. But then I got to this place, Jesus brought me to this place where I had to ask myself, what is normal? Does normal imply that one does not have to fight any type of battle? Does it imply that if someone is normal, then they're not in need of any type of recovery? I contend the fact that no one is normal. Normal isn't a thing. The world is broken, and so we are broken. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. We've all been touched by this. As we begin to understand this reality, we find very quickly that no one is a normie. Not a single one of us in this room is a normie. We are all in need of recovery from something. I've spoken to countless groups as well of people who aren't in addiction, aren't in recovery. And I've seen it time and time again, the look written on their faces of people who just have it all over them that I don't necessarily struggle with the drugs or alcohol or pornography or something, but I'm, I need help. I need recovery from something. I, all of this stuff that you're talking about, I can relate to. I don't know what to do with it. I see it all the time, and so it's become one of my favorite things to do, to try to bring recovery and the 12 steps and, and the beauty that we learn in that to the normie community. <laughs> it's such a beautiful thing. So it's imperative for us to understand that we are all using something in order to cover up some type of pain. I actually prefer to use the term user over addict because we're all using something. So if we can, but for a moment, just put any preconceived notions or biases or histories aside and look at the root. I believe that we can start on a more empathetic path that'll prove to be very beneficial. You see, at the root of addiction or harmful patterning is a misunderstanding of our identity as humans. It's a misunderstanding of the Imago Dei. That Genesis 1:26 that God said, let us create man in our image. In his image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are created in the image of God. But we know that sin enters into the world, disrupts that harmony between God and creation, and begins to distort that identity. Doesn't take it. Just starts to distort it, hide it. And so Satan, he saw this power vacuum, and he still sees this power vacuum, and he swoops in and he hijacks that identity. And we hear in Revelation 12, 10, Satan is referred to as the accuser of our brothers and sisters. In John 8, 44, Jesus says that when Satan lies, he's speaking his native language because he is a liar, he is the father of lies. So he comes in, and he begins distorting our idea of what it means to be human. I say this a lot. Oftentimes we think that, that our journey is, as believers or whatever is to be less human, to move away from hu being human. That's not the case. We read in Genesis that human is good. Human is made in the image of God. But Satan has attempted to take us away from that, to skew that, to move us as far away from being truly human as we can. But we need to get back to that humanity. Because of sin in the world, both self-committed sin, sins that we commit, 
and sin committed by others against us, we often fall victim to believing the lies of this accuser. And what are those lies? We've all heard lies in our lives. You'll never be enough. You'll never be good enough. They'll never forgive you. You're just a waste of space. You're no good to anybody. This is all you'll ever be. Even if you stop for a little bit, it's only a matter of time, you'll go back to it. The world would be a better place without you in it. And consequently, what happens from that distorted identity is we fall into the shame and guilt cycle. You see, shame makes us feel as though we can't get better and that who we are is who we always will be. We hear it all the time. I, I've always been this way. I've always been like this. So shame then leads to guilt. And guilt makes us dislike or even hate ourselves, which results in us acting in ways that we don't like, that may be harmful to ourselves and or others. It causes us to live in a state of self-condemnation that manifests itself in self-sabotage. Self we then buy into a false view of ourselves as worthless, and then guilt leads right back into shame. And most people go about their lives stuck in this shame and guilt cycle, not understanding that they need to or knowing how to pause that cycle for just a moment to try to get to the heart of what's happening here. Why am I stuck in this shame and guilt cycle? What are the lies that I'm believing? But we have to do that, and we have to help people get to a place, provide people a safe space to be able to press pause and to look at the heart of the issue and, say, and see that we are all powerless over this yoke of sin that's keeping us in that shame and guilt cycle. Now, that powerless word that makes people uncomfortable sometimes, especially in the church, Let's get a little bit of, let's get some healthy perspective on it. I want to talk about powerlessness for just a moment. 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Paul is talking about the thorn in his flesh, right? Thorn in his side. We don't really know what it is. So many people think it's so many different things. Doesn't matter. It's this thing in his life that's awful. <laughs> and he's pleading with the Lord to take it from him. It says this. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The first step in recovery and the 12 steps is that we admitted we were powerless and that our lives had become unmanageable. And so for those of us on the outside, for, for those who are on the outside looking in, that can be a really difficult thing for them to understand because often they are the victim of our choices or our behaviors. And so it kind of feels like you're just gonna cop out and say that it wasn't your fault, that you were just powerless, you had no choice to do this thing. That's not the case. See, in recovery, it's all or nothing. If I can control something nine times out of 10, but the 10th time I succumb to it, I'm powerless over it. That's powerlessness, the definition of it. If something to begins to creep in and affect my relationships, affect my work, affect my daily life, it has, by definition, become unmanageable. That's powerlessness and unmanageability. So when we admit that we're powerless, it's not an attempt to remove the weight of responsibility. It's quite the opposite. It's accepting the reality that our attempt to have power over whatever it is has done an incredible amount of harm and damage to us and to others around us. So when we look at this powerlessness, and a lot of people look at that and then they look at the scripture and they're like, wait, but no, there's, there, there's power in, in faith. And, and yes, that all of, yes, all of that, none of this contradicts each other. It's because of this. 
we're powerless over that thing. But in order to have power over it, we must get rid of this thing. We must get as far away from this thing as we can. We must bring it to the cross, lay it down at the foot of the cross, and hand it over to Christ. He then takes this thing, Holy Spirit abides in us. Now we have power through the Spirit over this thing. But apart from Christ, we have no power over this. That's powerlessness. Me and my flesh, I'm absolutely powerless over anything. It's only through the Spirit's work in my life that I have power over anything. So ultimately, it's He that has the power. Oftentimes, the sad reality is that we are the ones that keep people in the never-ending cycle of shame and guilt. Because we just can't let them forget. What were you thinking? How could you? Yeah, I know, I know you're doing well, but remember you did this thing. Remember you said this thing. I thought you said you weren't going to do that anymore. Or maybe we don't necessarily say anything like that. But we treat them differently than we treat other people. And we kind of always have this little chip on our shoulder that's like, hey, I may not say anything about it, but I remember. I remember the pain you caused. See, as the church, we have to be inviting all people into the story of hope and redemption, no matter what sin they're battling. I think at this point I'd be remiss if I didn't hope to humble each of us by reminding us of what Paul wrote in Romans 7, 14 through 25. It's a very common verse, but I want you to pay particular attention to the seeming insanity of, this, of the sentence structure in this passage, okay? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do not do what I want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Insane. This sounds insane, does it not? It's beautiful, it's God's word. I'm not saying anything like heretical. It sounds crazy. The way he writes this sounds crazy, and I think he perfectly puts into words the insanity of sin and chaos of which he himself, Paul, the guy who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he himself struggled. And in this description, we find such a beautiful snapshot of what addiction feels like. And you got to hear in Kim's story, it, to, to just a, a normie, Let's use the word, I don't believe in it, but let's just use that word for the sake of clarity. Listening to Kim's story, it's like, that's insane. Right? That, that, that's crazy. Why did you not get out? What? You just kept, it's chaos. But there's some, there's some strange thing. Our flesh all of a sudden starts to, all of a sudden, all this, over time, starts to utilize this chaos as this security blanket. And it becomes this devil that we know. And it's a strange comfort or a facade. It's a placebo. But we become addicted to this chaos. And it's insane. <laughs> it's insane. 
You can read it in this passage. It, it blows my mind that Paul just like nails it. Even outside of addiction, it does not make any logical sense that we know the right thing, but we don't do it. We know the right thing to do, but we don't do it. And even more so, in the world of addiction, we have to understand, again, that there is so much more at play than just an individual's own choices. Tracy, you said a couple times that there isn't a choice in it. I, I married to you, so I know what you're saying. There, she, this isn't like going against what she was saying. Choice is a part of addiction. It's not all of it, but it involves choice. However, inability to choose wisely can easily become tainted after wounds have occurred in our lives. There's a quote from Edgar Allan Poe that's one of my favorites about addiction. This is beautiful. He wrote, I have absolutely no pleasure in the stimulants in which I sometimes so madly indulge. It has not been in the pursuit of pleasure that I have periled life and reputation and reason. It has been the desperate attempt to escape from torturing memories, from a sense of insupportable loneliness, and a dread of some strange impending doom. Troy says it all the time. We don't ask why the addiction, we ask why the pain or why the hurt. And one of the things that we need to remember is that while many people started using whatever it is because they wanted to or desired it, oftentimes some people were forced into it. But the majority of people, they, they, it, was a, it was a choice in the beginning. It's something they desired, something they wanted to do, something that was appealing. We turned 13, we talked about it. But it quickly, remo it, it quickly, that's not the case. It starts to become something that you have to do to keep from getting sick. You're terrified of normalcy. You don't have any coping skills. And that's what often leads to death is because you get stuck in that cycle. And so for those of us who make it through to be able to get to meetings, we begin the long, slow journey of again just ripping our lives and our hearts wide open to get to the heart of the issue. And this family is exactly where the church needs to step in. I'll be the first to say that Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, God used those rooms to bring me to him. In some strange way, he used those rooms because you're not supposed to say the name of Jesus in those rooms. You say higher power, whatever, doorknob, whatever it is, okay? But somehow, through that, God brought me to him in these rooms. So I'm not discounting them. I think there was value in those rooms. But again, many of them are not welcoming of Jesus. They encourage you to identify as an addict for the rest of your life. And the 12 steps, they're absolutely incredible. And of course they are. They're borrowed Christian capital. However, the 12 steps apart from Christ is just simply another exercise in futility. It's an attempt at behavior modification. And what we need is not behavior modification, we need a heart and spirit transplant. So the 12 steps are beautiful. Yes, we want the 12 steps, but Christ is at the center of all of it. He has to be. So how does the church step in? I wanna share very briefly, just a snapshot of my story. Um, because at the end of my story is, is, is exactly how the church steps in. Um, I started using it at a very, very young age. Um, had some friends whose older brothers uh, were drug dealers and, and all these things started with weed like many of us and, and quickly got into harder and harder things. Um, I got, it just became a really violent, aggressive person. I was angry. Um, just had broken relationships in, in my home and, and in the community, and I, man, I was just angry. And so I was just using this fuel, and I was going deeper and deeper into drug and alcohol addiction through middle school 
and through high school. I was, I was failing classes, I was doing terrible. Um, I was a, a witness and involved in many different uh, criminal activities that, that to this day I, you know, I deal with and, 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 and uh, have to continually hand over. Um, but toward the end of high school, I experienced um, something that was, that was just, shook the ground beneath me. I, I can't explain any other way than that. Um, and it, it sent me into a period of abstinence from using. Now, during that time, that period of abstinence, I thought that I had given my life to Jesus. And I always say it like I gave my desire to give my desire to give my life to Jesus, to him. It was like this weird thing. Like I wanted to. I was like, I'm, I will, I'm going to, but I didn't really. But other people didn't know that. And so I somehow, by the skin of my teeth, got my grades up. No, I didn't even get my grades up enough. I got into every college I applied to and didn't meet any of the requirements. It was insane. <laughs> it, Belmont was one of them. It was like, like good schools. It wasn't just like little, you know. It was like Belmont, Samford, Liberty, Blue Ridge, and Carson Newman. I, I just, all I knew is I wanted to go to a Christian college. I didn't know, like in the South for some reason. So I just Googled Christian colleges and applied to them. Got into all of them. Didn't meet any of the requirements. But I had to, because they were Christian schools, I had to write an essay on like my story. So I think they were like, hey, let's give this guy a shot. And I got kicked out two years after being at Samford, but it's fine. And, but I met Tracy during that time, it was beautiful. When I went back home, that period of abstinence ended. And I, I, I didn't realize, I never addressed the fact that I was actually, um, at that point in my life, an addict. And so I started drinking again. And I was keeping it from Tracy, I was keeping it from my family. I brought it into our marriage. We got married in 2007. And so began many, many years of a broken marriage, of me going job to job, us having to move out of our condo and live in an upstairs room in this, this people's house um, that didn't have any room for us, but we had to live in there. And, and all the while harboring and hiding this addiction. And I would go through periods of abstinence and I was working in churches and I was preaching. I was a youth pastor during this time, for about two and a half years of it. Just the absolute poster child for what it looks like to live as an, a hypocrite, a double life. And I had become so comfortable with this. I was a master of manipulation. I'd started, the first joint I smoked, I was 10 years old. And so I started from that point, learning how to hide, how to stay in the shadows, what to say, what to do to make people think you're okay that you're getting along fine, all the while dying. So, fast forward. Um, I overdosed at my in-law's house, Christmas 2017, and uh, that sent me on, I, I, I just went off the rails. There were no more periods of abstinence from that point forward. Um, Tracy at the time was leading mission trips to Cambodia with Belmont students and doing amazing things. And at the time we had three daughters, Nellie, Eddie, and Georgia. Georgia was just a baby. She was going to Cambodia. And uh, my parents were coming up to help me out with the girls. And so I had believed, I had listened to the lies of the accuser for so long in my life and he finally got to me. And so I'd made a plan to take my life while she was in Cambodia. And I could, every single night, I'd go out to the garage where I would use every night. And I'd sit there. And, and, I, and I'd wrestle back and forth with, with doing it. And I'd just think, tomorrow, tomorrow. And it got to where I wanted to see Tracy one more time. When she got back, there's so much to this story. She got back, this huge blow up happened. She started following me around the house, carrying Georgia, our baby, and, and saying, what's wrong? Something's wrong, something's wrong. Tell me what's wrong. And she would not let me be. She nagged me to death. 
She followed me everywhere, in and out of every room. I was just, I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. And so, because at this point, I had lost like 47 pounds in six months. So there was something clearly wrong. So I remember standing at the, at the kitchen sink. Some of you have heard this. My apologies. Um, I was standing at the kitchen sink, and she was standing behind me holding Georgia. And I, I remember this, this thing, this, like a lump in my throat, like that feeling we've all felt, but I felt it in my feet. And it was moving up through my legs, and I was standing there, and I was pretending to like do the dishes or something. And this thing was moving up through my body, and as it got up into my stomach and into my chest, I'm thinking, what is this? And as it gets up into my throat, I, I no joke, I literally was like, I'm about to tell the truth for the first time in my life, and I have absolutely no control over it. And at that point, my mouth opened up and I screamed out, Tracy, I'm still using drugs, I'm still drinking, and I'm gonna kill myself. And it shocked me. It was the first time in my life that I'd actually told the truth, that I hadn't just told a half truth and kept something in my back pocket. And so I'm standing there and I have my hands on the kitchen sink and I'm thinking, this is it. I'm gonna turn around, she's gone, this is it. I put her life through hell the last nine years. This is it. This is where the church comes in. I turned around and she was standing there like an absolute gangster holding Georgia. And she said, it's okay. It's all right, we can do this. We can do this. So I proceeded to walk her around and show her every spot where I hid all of my drugs. That next week was hell. I, that next week was insane. I had to go home for a 15-year high school reunion. It was like crazy. It was so weird. And, and so we get back that next weekend. I hadn't yet found recovery. That next weekend, June 16th, we're driving home from my brother and sister-in-law's house. And, and I'm just, man, I'm broken. I'm like, I haven't used this last week, but I am like, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I need to be out of this. I need to be off this earth. You girls are gonna be better off without me. And so we're driving down Briley Parkway and she's Googling something and I don't know what and we get home and we, and we pull into the driveway at 8.15 and she takes the three girls out of the van and she gives me an address to a place called the Last Stop Club. She's like, go there now. So I drove to the Last Stop Club and I walked in at 8.33. And I thought, I sat down and this dude named Big Steve he, he, all I remember is I sat down and he's like, I don't care what you did yesterday. I don't care what you did this morning. If you're here right now and in, you're in this meeting, you are a mother effing champion. And I, and I was like, I broke. I absolutely broke down crying. Not happy tears, tears that said, that's the type of small victory that I have to celebrate, that I'm just sitting in this room not high right now, there's no way I can do this. So I left that room, I'm standing in the lobby and I think, I keep thinking to myself, if I walk out of this place and I don't connect with somebody, I'm losing my life, I'm done. And so I stood there and I was looking at this dry erase board for like 10 minutes, just staring on it, it had like two things written on it, I looked like an idiot. And I'm just like staring at it and people are passing by and I, and, I, and, I, and I look back in the room and I see this man, he's making eye contact with me and I, the spirit just pushed me to him. And so I walked into this room and I walked up to him and he said, hey, I'm Jonathan. And I said, hey, I'm Joel. And I broke, just absolutely broke. And he grabbed me and he said, it's okay, you're safe now. You're safe now. That's what we do as the church. It's so simple. We just be a safe place for people who have had their identities hijacked and distorted and twisted in such a way that they themselves can't get back to it. They need people to come alongside of them and say, We're, you're safe now and I'm gonna walk with you whatever it takes, no matter what this looks like, no matter how much this hurts, we're walking with you through this thing. And you're not an other, you're one of us. So we respond like Tracy responded and saying, we can do this 
We respond like Jonathan responded and saying, you're safe here. And we respond like Jason responded to me when I met him when I was three months clean. I was looking for a new space for our nonprofit, got linked up with Jason, who was the, the lead pastor here, started the replant process, incredible dude. Um, we met at Portland Brew East, and I was looking for a new space for my nonprofit. He had this big building, 313 wasn't here yet. It was just him and a 96-year-old secretary named Miss Helen, and, and 57,000 square feet of just mothballs and burgundy carpet. And, and he had all this space, and, and he was like, yeah, you can have the whole third floor. And, and, and would you and your family want to come and see what we're doing here? We, there's like 15 elderly people here, and we're, we're doing this replant, and it's, and it's beautiful. Come and check it out. So I was like, yeah. And at the end of that meeting, I thought, oh, crap. I forgot to tell you something. Because he had already given me the whole third floor. <laughs> like the whole third floor. And, and invited me and my family to come and like be a part of this thing. I said, hey man, I forgot to tell you something. You should probably know. I'm three months clean off of 23 years of drug and alcohol addiction. And I thought for sure he was gonna be like, oh, uh, oh, okay. I wish, I wish you would have said that at the beginning. Um, let me get back to you about those things. 100%, dude, there was no doubt in my mind. I was like, this is great, this is all, I had the third floor, now I'm not gonna have it. 100%. I said that to him, and he just looked at me. I'll never forget it, man. He just looked at me, and he was like, that's so beautiful, man. Congratulations. Thanks for sharing that with me. What can I do to support you? I was like, uh, uh, I can stop the whole third floor? He was like, yeah. Like, okay, cool, cool. You hear, like, 23 years. Three months clean, that's it. He's like, yeah, man, what? let's walk through this. That's how we respond as the church. Guys, we don't have to overcomplicate this. This church has been such a safe place for me. This church has been the epitome of what it looks like to walk alongside people who are struggling and battling addiction and not enabling them, but empowering them. Because that's what's been happening to me over the last five years. See, I started here just volunteering as a guy who was three months clean. And then Jason was like trying to find work to, for me because I was, wouldn't leave. And then, and then he, he was like, well, uh, I don't know, maybe like start community groups or something. So then I started doing that. And then all this stuff. And then I got, went part time. I was like, this is crazy. And then I got went finished seminary and, and got ordained and went full time and then last fall became the stepped into the lead pastor role. It's insane. If somebody here reads that story on paper, it's like, what? It still feels crazy to say that five and a half years ago, I, like I was gonna take my life. Man, that's the power that the church has to come alongside people and empower them and lift them up and say that, hey, we don't see you the way Satan has made you see yourself. We see you the way God created you to be. We see you as created in the image of God, nothing else. You are an imager of the Most High God. So we have to be a safe space for people to come clean. We have to watch the way that we speak about people who are battling addiction. We don't make assumptions or formulate opinions about this or that methadone clinics, uh, medicated assisted treatment, all of that stuff, we don't make opinions about those things unless we educate ourselves in those things. And we are open to any and everybody who walks through these doors. And we're open to any and everybody that the Holy Spirit is leading us to out in the community. You see, Jesus, he did not just minister to people with sins that he could identify with. Newsflash, he was sinless. He knew that all sin was separation from him, separation from God, and that he was the only one that could reconcile people unto God. So we do not get to pick and choose what type of sinners we want to minister to. 
We recognize that we are sinners saved by grace, sent on mission to find and reach out to sinners who are crying out for grace. It's our call. We don't pick and choose. So we educate ourselves. I seriously encourage you, I will go with you. Zach will go with you. Any, any, anybody in recovery will go with you. Go to a meeting. Go to a meeting. An open meeting, nobody's gonna, you don't have to do anything. Nobody makes you talk, nothing. People will probably hug you and get you a coffee or something because we exchange drugs for coffee. Um, I never fell victim to that, thank goodness. Go. Pick a night, we'll go. It'll change your life. It'll change the way you view, you view the addiction recovery community. It'll change the way you view your life. I think it'll uncover some things. Get involved in the lives of those who are battling the disease of addiction. Honest question, don't need to answer this. For us at Hope, we have an entire recovery organization that calls Hope home. Like half of our congregation is in recovery. How many names of them do you know? How many times have you been to the hustle recovery houses? How many phone numbers do you have? How many times have you, instead of all hustle people here and all hope people here, how many times have you gone and sat in the midst of them? Dude, that's myself included. I don't get to the houses near as much as I should. We're all called to do it. God has brought these people to our doorstep. It's beautiful. Churches would, would do anything to have the opportunity that we have here at Hope. Hey, here's a hundred people <laughs> going out of prostitution and murder and thievery and prison. And, and here, I'm going to put them right here with you, right next to you. And we're like, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't know. It's tough. It's tough. There's no shame in it. Please, I don't want, it, I don't want anybody to feel any shame or guilt. Because I, I feel the same thing. I don't connect near as much as I should. But we have such a beautiful opportunity here. And no matter what church you're at, you have people in that sanctuary who are battling this disease. We got to learn to be empathetic. I'm, I'm done here in like one minute. And we have to learn to be empathetic, yet not compromise. We need to be able to tend to the wounds of people, but also being willing to be honest about our and their sin in recognizing that just as others have wounded us, we ourselves have wounded others. And we just constantly remind ourselves that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That the wages of that sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If anybody in here tonight is like, man, I feel like there's some things that I need to take a look at in my life. I need to talk about, I need to think about. You are safe here. I, I tell you from experience, you are safe here. Please do not go on, continue on with whatever it is, addiction to control, anxiety, pornography, alcohol, and whatever. Do not go on thinking that you have to hide that thing. You are safe here to share that and let us walk with you through that as the church. So, I am going to now invite, I'm sorry guys, that was long. What, dude, it's 740? Dude, we're killing it. Okay. I'm going to ask our friends to come up, um, and Tracy, who's also my friend, but my wife. Um, Tracy, Troy, Kim, John. Um, just wanna open it up right now for a time for anything that's been talked about tonight. The medical, like, nerdy stuff, ask a question about that. Kim's story, or anything that I've said, 
just anything that's out there that you've been thinking or wondering about, and no question is off limits, okay? So don't feel like it's gonna seem like insensitive, ask anything, okay? Um, and we'll just start it if anybody has anything that they wanna ask. Also, real quick, while you're thinking of questions, this is John Hughes, this is Troy Sandifer, and they started um, Hustle Recovery, which is the recovery organization, ministry that's here with us. Um, how many people have you gotten into treatment over the last two? Just in the last little over two years, over 3,000 people into treatment. What was that number of 2021? There was, there was 4,000 overdose that, dude, that's insane. And it all started with a little Facebook post. I love it. Um, and then Kim, you know Kim. She's Troy's significant other. And also helps run Hustle. And then you know Tracy. So just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so. People that you guys see come here, we um, we don't have time to tell this whole story, um, but if you want to come out next Saturday night, we're going to have a banquet downstairs um, where you'll hear a lot of the story of how God got us to where we are. Um, yeah, hustle, exactly. Um, the people who you guys see come in here are in early recovery. Um, these are usually people who have contacted me, John, or Kim, or or Miss Leanne or some of our other staff members, and we help them get into a treatment center. Um, when we first met these people, they were in active addiction. Uh, many had overdosed and, and lived a lot of the same stories that Kim and I and John have. So we help to get them into a treatment facility. And then when they leave that treatment facility is when they come to us. Um, 30 days clean is a very scary time. <clears throat> You have been depending on this drug for whatever period of time to change the way that you feel. Um, he talked about the normies. What, what the difference in what a normie is and, and what a drug addict is is only this, is that a drug addict figured out, we don't have to feel that way. I can change the way I feel instantly. And we did that over a period of time until it became unmanageable and we were powerless over it. It, it became our higher power. So you asked me where these people are as Christians. Um, and, and this is something that I need help with the church with. Me, me and Joel actually had this conversation not long ago because we're certified as a faith-based um, ministry. And he asked me one day, he said, what exactly makes you faith-based? And I'll be honest, it was hard for me to answer. To answer. So he talked about how in the, in the 12 step rooms, the 12 step fellowship, how they don't mention Christ. But we stole it all from, from uh, biblical stuff. It was from the six tenets is where it all comes from. So what happens in early recovery, a lot of times people, they have this huge disconnect from God and they're looking for God. They're, they're looking for But a lot of people sometimes will have um, religious trauma. Um, so you, we, we ease into it. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you're just, you know, you're like, you have, like a lot of people do, where you're like, um, how could God let this happen? And it takes a while to heal from that. Um, so what we don't do is I don't cram Jesus down their throat. I don't. It's, for us, it's attraction, not pr promotion, okay? 
um, and me and Joe were actually speaking about this earlier today, what we try to do is we show them the love of Christ. You know what I mean? And eventually what happens over time, usually it's a couple of months in, and people will pull you to the side and they'll say, hey man, why, where do you get this joy at? How are you just happy all the time? Like, didn't you tell me that you're serving out a 16 year sentence on community corrections, like you're a convicted drug dealer and all this other stuff, but you just seem, you just, you're happy and you love people. And then that's when I take the opportunity to say, man, that's, that's Christ in me. You know, that's, that's where I got that from. But it took me working these 12 steps to find that. Um, you know, in our, our fellowship literature, you get to page 109 before it says, you'll call him by name. But you do call him by name eventually. Um, so it's, it's kind of a delicate balance in the beginning. That's why it is mandatory that they come here on Sundays. It, it is, it is. And, and they kind of bucked me at first. But luckily, this congregation and, and Joel's preaching, it sucked them in, you know what I mean? After they come two or three, four times, then, then I don't have the problems getting them up in, on set, Sunday mornings and getting them here, you know what I mean? They, they start to get to where they're ready to go. It is, they know that coming in the door, that look, we're gonna go to work, we're gonna get back to work every day, we're gonna save some money, we're gonna work the 12 steps, and we're gonna go to church on Sundays. Um, above and beyond that, we do have voluntary Bible studies. Uh, if you're looking for a way to help us, that's a great way, is to, to come bring a Bible study into one of our houses. We have three in Antioch, and we have two big properties out in Cheatham County, like right down the road from Joel's house. Um, and the other way, man, is just what I really want to see here is for, and a lot of them have, like Benji just got baptized this last week. He's one of our graduates. Dee got baptized. She's one of our house leaders. Guys, we're just, we, we came to Hope Church because we were looking for a place that people could belong. And that's what we found here. Um, these people are people just like you are. Um, maybe they've had a few more struggles and a few more hurts but, and, and maybe sometimes they're gonna make you feel awkward like Kim did earlier when she, when she starts telling you those things and you're like, wow, I can't believe she said that, you know? But that's what we learn to do. Yeah. If, if, we, if we don't put it out there, guys, then we can't deal with it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, um, it says in the Bible, you know, you confess with your mouth and then you repent. And that's what we're trying to do here. Even though they don't realize that early on, that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> well, I love what Joel said move over move over you know what I mean just say hey man what's up I'm gonna sit here by you today how you doing how you feeling you doing okay that thank you hogging it um, is we we're it's a suggestion to you know help us to stay clean and sober um, and to lead a happy life is to do the uncomfortable work so that doesn't just include us though. Like Joel said, all of us need recovery. So all of us tend to isolate, you, and, and it's because it's, it's awkward to sit next to somebody when you don't know anything about, or maybe that you do know there's a possibility that that person may have been an ex-prostitute or a needle user or whatever, but we are normal people. I get told all the time that you don't look like that type of person. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, I get offended by that. I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I'll show you how savage I can be. <laughs> but yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Our hope is, is that 
after they've been coming here every Sunday for six months, we're going to continue to do so. And we had to go through this this past year. Yeah, so um, some of the guys that do kind of like our security in the morning, that like check the premises and do that thing, they're graduates of Hustle um, who continue coming. Uh, we're in conversation right now about what it would look like to start like an alumni group here at the church. So when people graduate, there's kind of like a community group here um, that's some of us, but then also some of the people who have graduated um, just to make sure that they're not just kind of going out into the ether. You know, it's like, no, 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 you're a part here. Um, I, I also want to say something to that really quick. I've heard a couple people say that. Um, it's hard because I don't know if they're going to be the, back the next week or I don't know how long they're going to be here. So it's hard to let, who cares? Who cares? There's, it doesn't matter if, if it's just one interaction and then they're not back. Like, that's heartbreaking, but man, you, you had that one interaction with them. Yeah, because Jason talked to me, and they, they have a name, you know? Yeah, it's huge. Um, he, he used to come and use with me at my hotel room, and then he got arrested and um, didn't see him again. <laughs> And so, but when he got sober and was working with Hustle and doing Window World, like, he would call me all the time. Like, it takes us that repetitiveness, because honestly, like, me and him, like, hung out and stuff. We were friends, but I never would have imagined that I would look at this man like he is, like, a brother, like, my best friend in life. That, you know, the consistency, that the um, showing that you're not intimidated by them, even if you are. Like, just continue. If somebody, if you say hi to one of them, and they just kind of, oh, that's probably going to happen, do it again next week. And do it again that next week, because eventually they'll open up and be like, something's up, because we're curious. But tell, when he was calling you, this is like my favorite thing. What's the excuse you gave him that you couldn't go to treatment? Oh, one of the excuses. Okay, so I had like everything in my hotel room. These are all, in, these are my things. And I had tires in my hotel room. And I was like, I've got tires in my room, John. I, I can't go. What am I gonna, like, what am I gonna do with them? <laughs> yeah, not a dog, not a human, a tire. No, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. That's all I was going to say. I mean, I would say as a normie myself and working in the field of addiction and around women every single day, like I think there, like, yes, there are stories that always, always surprise me, you know what I mean, that I'm not expecting. And I've heard so many things and just terrible, terrible stories of what have happened to people. But like the other day I was going to see a woman and she was sitting on her bed and just really in a bad state and I asked her if I could sit down with her because she was wanting to leave and she said sure and I sat down with her and she started telling me about how she had been trafficked and she'd been pro she had been prostituting and then she became trafficked and all of these things and she's like but the only thing I can find right now she's like somebody gave me this bible and I've read it from the beginning and she's like I've read the first like four books of it and I said well have you read about G or I said you need to read about Jesus and the woman at the well I said because that's you that's your story and I, I was able to share that story about Jesus going to this woman and saying like, turn from your ways and follow me and you don't have to feel shame and guilt over that. But I think that it's moments like that, like you could be sitting in a pew sitting next to someone and you can just ask them about their story and they may feel enough to, like comfortable enough just to open up to you and you have that opportunity to share Jesus to them at that moment. So I think there's just that piece of like asking God to be with you in those moments. A lot of times I'm like, God, give me what to say right now because I need your help. But I think it's in those moments that God moves in people's lives because he knows that's what they need right now. It's, what's the stats on this stuff, guys? It's not good, you know? So just that, that first talk, the interaction, you, I mean, we have a lot of turnover, but every, every place like this does, you know? Uh, next door has, I mean, it's every day a turn, you know? Yeah. You know, so so we got to be okay with that turnover and not let that stop us. 
to talk, you know. Um, earlier in my recovery, I needed, I needed a place like this, you know. Um, luckily, luckily, I had Joel, you know. Um, he was not the pastor yet, but I had Joel, so he kind of fellowship with me and, and, and helped me. But I would, at this time, you know, three months clean, I would have loved a church like this that was recovery-based. Uh, um, it probably would have helped me not struggle as much as I did early in recovery, you know. I've, uh, my daughter is actually out here. I ought to get her to come in and answer it. Um, through my addiction and my early recovery, I didn't see my daughter or my son for four years. Um, back in April, God blessed me for the opportunity to be a father again, and she moved here from New York City, and now she lives with me. Um, You're saying, what can, a, what can a child do for a parent who's an addict, right? So the biggest thing is going to be forgiveness. Just as Jesus forgave us, we have to forgive others. Um, forgiveness and, and tolerance and understanding. Um, we do a lot of bad things to hurt our kids in addiction. And I don't want to use it as a cop out at all, but like the things that she was saying about the addicted brain is sometimes you just can't help it. Um, like she said, you, 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 you lose the use of your frontal cortex. Um, that's, that's the part of your brain that does reasoning and empathy, and critical thinking. And then you, you start to just live off of those impulses that, that reward system it's the reason why you can see a pregnant woman and use and she's using and in your mind if you haven't been there you're like how could she do that but the reason that she she has no choice but do that because that's that's the part of her brain that's functioning um it's it's almost like life or death like you you have to do it um, and I guess the, the best thing a child could do for a parent is just to understand that, um, to encourage them. Um, know that we're not going to work this recovery thing perfect all the time. Um, actually, it, and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, like she said, it can take up to two years for your brain to actually heal um, and, and start to, to make new neural pathways. Um, it doesn't make it okay anything that might have happened to the child. Um, but I think what we've learned in the church is that forgiveness is, is kind of for ourselves, you know what I mean? Not necessarily for the, the person who wronged us. It doesn't make it okay, but it allows you to be able to release that. Um, and sometimes that's what you need to do to be able to love that person. Um, the main thing here, man, is just showing love, you know? Jesus, um, he came to love us that were, were not real easy to love, you know? And people in addiction aren't always easy to love. That's why we, we destroy a lot of relationships, and it's, uh, it's a hard road putting that back together. But <clears throat> I, I do want to give you one statistic to leave with you because uh, Dr. Lloyd actually said this at the last time I heard him speak. There are more people today in the United States living in recovery than are living in addiction. 
So it, that gives me hope to know that, that, that people can recover and there, there are more people living in recovery in the United States than are actually living in addiction. Yeah, and I think that's something that, that we don't see very often. And what that tells me is that my God is a God of second chances. <clears throat> no, I was just going to say from a, if you don't know, we also have some women in the church, obviously through Hustle, but we have a lot of Jonah's Journey moms that come and they all bring their kids. And so I think if you wanted to get involved in women that are in recovery, that are back with their kids and at Renewal House or something like that, we have a lot of those moms that need support and need help. So like getting involved, even just like, hey, why don't you go out to dinner and I'll watch your kids or let me take you guys out to dinner or whatever that looks like. But I would just think, like I was just thinking of that when you're kind of saying that we have moms with kids. So you will be impacting both the kid and the mom's life by giving her a little bit of stress relief. I mean, I just can't imagine being a single mom, but you know, so, so kind of helping in that regard as well. I got one, one thing to say on this. Um, Kayla and I am not sure like what your history looks like. Um, and I don't know what amends have been made, but I'm so sorry for what you went through. Um, I can say as a parent um, that there's not a day that goes by, and I don't talk about it with my kids a lot, not in detail, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't wish that I could go back and do things differently. I'm keeping my, my girls in the back seat of the, my truck and leaving them out there for hours while I'm in a drug dealer's house or putting them in front of the TV while I'm passed out in the bedroom for hours. And, you know, it, it, things that they probably don't even necessarily remember, but I feel that pain and I feel that. And so just know that, um, man, she, she regrets it. She feels it. Um, I hope there's some comfort in that, you know? Um, wishes she could do things differently. Yeah. No, just kidding. Okay, so I was thinking about this the entire time. Um, and part of my story that I didn't really integrate into it, only because I didn't have time, was um, my son, he is 18 now. He'll be 19 in, Dece or in December. He's at UT his freshman year. My son has... He was at five, he was, he knew to put a needle on, a cap on a needle. He's pulled needles out of mine and his dad's arms. Um, he traumatized, traumatized. I dropped him off at my dad's and left him there um, for 12 years, was gone. And literally he ran from me. I was, I was a terrifying person on drugs. Um, when I got sober, when I started my recovery journey, he was 16 years old, well, the second time anyway. Um, and one of the best things that Russell did for me, and this was for him too, was set boundaries. Um, for me, like him telling me, mom, cause I, I'm one of those, I will get manic on you real quick. I will spam your phone. And if I'm an overthinker, you're not answering, like I'm freaking out, like what are, what's going on? You don't love me, like why? Um, so that's how I, especially in early recovery, so Russell was like mom, because it made his, his anxiety so high whenever he would see that his mom, he knew his mom was in treatment, and he knew that, like, I was trying, and he wanted to be supportive, but it was making him have this anxiety and this guilt because he couldn't answer the phone. He was, he was living his teenage life, and rightfully so, and here I am sitting in treatment, in a break or sitting on, you know, looking through the book and being like, what's my kid doing? You know, like I've got every, like I have a right to even wonder what he's doing. So the healthy boundaries for me was awesome. Like it trained me like a dog. It trained me to have some respect and to be able to st st have some integrity, stick to what I say and actually like try like and, and respect him. Like, cause I didn't at all. Like he was, and I, uh, there was a point where I was like, this is my road dog, my three-year-old. Going to the dope man, so this is my road dog. Like, that's not cool, that's not cute, it's awful, it's sick. But, yeah, for, for me, that was, like, huge. Russell setting boundaries, so. Got to, it's 8.06, so we could do, like, one more, two more. I mean, if whoever, if you have to leave, you can leave. We're, we're kicking it, so. 
Any other questions? Zach. Yeah, I, that's actually, I, I had part of that in my notes and I somehow didn't say it, but some of the, the deepest, most beautiful wisdom I've ever heard is out of the mouths of ex-porn addicts, ex-crack dealers, prostitutes, like wisdom that I've never heard any, anywhere else, not read in Dostoevsky, nowhere. Stuff that like you only can hear in these rooms. Um, and it makes me long, long to see that culture within the church. We have to have it. So, dude, you're so right. We have so much to learn. This is a church, what it looks like, a confession. Um, I'll say uh, just kind of one more thing. We, we have, um, I was gifted with a beautiful opportunity a couple years ago to come in on the tail end of um, the creation of something that Zach was leading the charge on. It's a, it's a Christ-centered approach to the 12 steps, and it's called ID recovery, identity recovery. Um, beautiful thing about ID recovery is that Christ is welcome in the room, obviously. Um, it's not forced in it. You can refer to yourself as an addict, whatever it is, um, but we encourage any and everybody to be a part of that whether it's drug, alcohol, porn addiction, control, anger, anything like that. It's, it's a, it's a Christ-centered approach to the 12 steps that makes it accessible to everybody. Um, and we are going to be relaunching that um, at the beginning of next year. And so we would love to have some of y'all be a part of it. We're actually going to be running at 9 o'clock in the morning, so kind of like a Sunday school hour. Um, we'll have a recovery meeting at 9 in the morning. It'll be open to the community. And uh, just encourage you guys to be praying about that and, and be a part of that as well. So, um, yes. I was just going to say that Joel basically had me walk through the 12 steps with him while he walked through the 12 <laughs> steps. Because I, they are. It's a gift. And it's crazy because I was, like, watching him. And I was like, I want that. Like, I want to, like, go through my life and look at all the things that I've done that are really crappy and like ask people for forgiveness and like, you know, and realize what my own issues are. Like I have an anger issue. So we had to work on that and do a lot of self-reflection. But like, so I think just being honest, like I think all of us have areas in our life. Yes, it may not be overtly in your face, but sometimes mine is. But um, yeah, I think it's really necessary and needed. And I told him that I was like, you need to write this for the church. You guys need to do this for the church because people need this. You haven't? <laughs> yeah, 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 that's why. <laughs> um, we'll be around for a little bit after this. If you guys want to continue to talk, um, you also know where to find us because we go to church here. So, um, Zach, would you, yeah, after Troy says something, could, would you be willing to close us out in prayer? I, I just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone that's here. Um, thank you for caring enough about this issue to come out and get some education on it tonight. Um, for a guy like me that, that works in this every day and comes from that kind of past, like 
I, I sat over here, well, I'm a titty baby anyway, but I sat over here and cried the whole time. So um, just thank you guys for caring enough to even wonder, you know, what to do next. So. Yeah, thank you. And we would, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, second, uh, uh, the next last, very, very last thing I'm going to say is um, this conversation, like I said at the beginning, is going to continue. we have been talking with a guy named Will Taylor, who you'll meet soon, who's going to be bringing workshops here that will be open to the community, the addicted brain, um, looking at sex and pornography addiction and all different kinds of things, just running the gambit and keeping the conversation open. So this isn't the last of it for sure. So. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, thank you for showing us in such vivid ways that you are a God of redemption who restores broken people, broken relationships. Thank you for the opportunity that we have had to um, witness that. Thank you that you do that, and we pray for those who are hurting tonight um, who are in addiction we pray that they might somehow know that you're with them and know your love tonight I pray that you would make us a church who has eyes to see the needs around us we pray that you would help break down barriers and walls between people break down wrong ideas about addiction, open up hearts, um, help us to see each other for who we really are, all beautifully made in your image, all sinners in need of redemption. Father, thank you for John and for Troy and for Kim, for Tracy and for Joel and for their leadership tonight. And I pray that this night would be something we can carry with us, that we would have uh, lessons we've learned, new perspectives we carry, and that, um, and that our church would be on a different trajectory um, because of this time. We ask all this um, in the name of Jesus, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.